Welcome to Gwinnett County Story Vault. Angie, we're happy to have you here today. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm really excited to be here to share kind of my journey of how I became a Gwinnettian. Cool beans. Well, one thing, I know that you're a principal and you've got to rush back <laughs> to take care of the kitties this afternoon. And so I just want to dive right in with you telling me, how did you land in Gwinnett? So my story for Gwinnett County um, began in 2003 when I became an assistant principal mm -hmm. at Harbin's Elementary. But um, I was actually teaching in a, in a neighboring district and I had the awesome privilege to have Dr. Francis Davis as my <gasps> professor at Georgia State University, mm -hmm. um, who was one of the associate superintendents mm -hmm. for human resource and talent. Mm -hmm. And so she saw something in me at, I feel like at a very young age <laughs> and she made me feel so at ease and she kept telling me that she felt like my fit was going to be in Gwinnett County and I kind of I really was in awe of who she was and how she um, presented herself and how she represented what Gwinnett was about mm -hmm. so it was very intriguing and she opened the door and allowed me the opportunity to come and interview and then after that point I did become an assistant principal and I was only at Harbin's one year oh. and um, that was but it was purposeful I really do believe things happen for a reason and I was placed with Dr. Patty Heitmuller and um, she was asked to go open up Louise Radloff Middle School mm -hmm. and what an awesome privilege to go open up Miss Radloff's Middle School and it was it's like coming home um, in essence because I um, had grown up in a Hispanic household and I was going back to a school I, I taught in a school that was majority Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and Radloff was opening up in an area that I felt like I could give back to my community. So it was, it was a great experience and I'm very thankful that those roads have led um, to being able to open up Louise Radloff Middle School. And then I was, I was there for a few years and that Gwinnett has really opened doors for me. Mm -hmm. And um, I was appointed to be principal at Craig Elementary um, on February the 14th of 2008. Ooh. So I just <laughs> celebrated my 10th year of being appointed to Craig. So that's kind of our journey. And we, my husband and I, we were married in Atlanta. And then in about 2005, we were both working in Gwinnett. And we knew that that was a place that we wanted to start our family and to move and to be a part of the community. So we personally, we made the move in 2005. So I'm a live, work, play, everything in Gwinnett <laughs> kind of person. <laughs> well, we're gl definitely glad to have you here. Yes. So your children go to the school that yes. you're a principal at. Yes. Is that a little awkward for them <laughs> at times? Uh, I, well, I think when you're in the earlier grades, so kindergarten, first and second, it's like, wow, your mom's the principal. But then it, as you, they get older, it's like, oh, your mom's the principal. She makes <laughs> the decisions. Yeah. Like, you know, do we really have to do work on cyber days? You know, <laughs> things of that nature. But that is an awesome blessing that I have been given. Um, Gwinnett has honored me um, to be a principal, but also be allowed to kind of have that balance between being a mother mm -hmm. and being a principal. And being able to have your children be a part of the work that you pour your heart and soul to every day is uh, something that I'm forever grateful uh, to be able to work in a district that really values their employees and right. allows that opportunity for them to be a part of it. So yes, it is cool. I get to see them in their programs. I see them walking down the hallway. Oh, you high five them. I high five them. <laughs> you know, we don't really high five. We, we more like, like the small way because <laughs> we don't want to be disruptive in that process. But um, I think it's just, it's an awesome experience, not only to see them do the work that we grow in as mm -hmm. educators. You know, I'm a, I believe I'm like a sponge. Anytime I can learn something new, a different strategy, a different approach to be able to reach all of our children, then that to me matters. I had an amazing educator who impacted my life, Miss Howard, um, and she was a special ed student. Mm -hmm. And so when I grew up in Alabama, you know, back in the, um, the early 80s, we were one of the first Hispanics to be in Auburn. And so they weren't quite sure what to do with us because we spoke English, uh, sorry, Spanish at home. Then we were, you know, acclimated into a school environment mm -hmm. that only spoke English. And so I was the third child. So my sister and brother, they were closer in age. So they learned all Spanish and then went to school and learned English. And I learned Spanglish. Oh boy. <laughs> so I was fluent in Spanish. I knew some English, but I had that whole language kind of like jumbled up in my head. Mm -hmm. 
So Miss Howard was a special education teacher, and so at that time they placed you in special education because that was the service that they could mm-hmm. provide for me. But I still have my IEP um, where it states that I was supposed to practice English and know the difference between English words and Spanish mm-hmm. words. I kind of laugh because I have the same friends from high school. I was like, how are you all friends with me? Because <laughs> I spoke half English, half Spanish, you know, with them. But, um, but someone, she believed in me and she never gave up on me. And um, she really, to me, grounded me on who I wanted to be as an educator. You know, when parents come to me and talk about their child and their struggling, their struggles and what we can do, I look at that opportunity and, and say, what can I do? Mm-hmm. Because Miss Howard never gave up on me. She actually gave me an angel when I graduated from high school that if you come to my office, it's placed right behind my, uh, on my armoire of my, de- oh, behind my desk. Special. Because anytime I'm on the phone or making a decision or sitting around, I, that's a symbol of what I'm really supposed to be doing mm-hmm. is trying to, trying to work with it. And Miss Howard never looked at us as different or she didn't give up. She said, I remember you being a little girl sitting on that rocking chair with your pigtails and you get so frustrated because in one language you knew the word, but you just couldn't get it out and trying to process and think through that. And she said, but she saw determination in me. (laughs) She saw what, how my parents um, really appreciated Mm -hmm. education and knew the value of it. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of grounds me into who I am as a principal. So going back to my kids, you know, I don't only want to just give it to them, but I think my role as an educator is to try to figure out the potential in all of our children, even when they don't see it in them and they're frustrated at times. Well, that is wonderful that you were fortunate <laughs> enough to have a few yes. mentors in your life that really did help you along your journey. And in many cases, it sounds like with two of them kind of pointed you in the right direction yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that your, your life's journey was going to yes. take you on. So as an educator, do you get opportunities to mentor other young ladies? Mm-hmm. Maybe that came from a Hispanic country. You can, your family's from Cuba, right? Yes. Your mom, and, mom mom and dad. Absolutely. But do you have opportunities to influence their life um, direction? So, um, so in the area with students, I think at, when I was at Radlaw, mm-hmm. that was one of my most important things that I was able to talk to, to young girls, mm-hmm. to tell them that the opportunities for them to be bilingual it will open doors for them. Absolutely. Uh, that at times we didn't think it would be possible. Mm-hmm. And even breaking molds out of our traditions, out of our culture. Um, I broke a tradition. I was I left my house prior to being married and that was really hard for my mother who valued that the young lady should stay home, mm-hmm. the the unity of that family. And I kind of broke that. I, was, I moved out um, when I went to Auburn University and lived in the dorm and did the sorority thing. I just <laughs> wanted I was always the type of person who wanted to try things differently mm-hmm. and um, and talking with my mom about that and adjusting and moving to Atlanta that was just very difficult that took about two years of laying that foundation <laughs> but telling girls that it's okay to you know still want to value being a family member and being a part of that family unit still mm-hmm. being a mother and being able to work and 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 also make you know a difference in what you value and what you want to accomplish in life. So having those conversations when I was placed at Radloff was really important. In my setting now, we have a mentor program. Mm. So I typically am a, I've, I've had the opportunity to mentor a student. Um, I have a mentee right now that her and I talk about it. We talk about what is it, what can you accomplish? And I want her to know that whatever she sets her goals to. Mm. You know, I, you have to look at our backgrounds and the walks that we've taken in life as opportunities, not versus obstacles. You know, people are going to say things about you or have a perception of who you are based on your last name mm-hmm. or what you might look like. But if you allow that to set the tone of who you are going to be, then that that's that's really going to bring you down. And you can't allow that. You, mm-hmm. we uh, To me, sometimes as a Latina woman or just a woman in, in some of these positions of power, you have to have a little thicker skin. You have to let some things roll off of mm-hmm. you and say, I know I can do it. You know, I believe in myself. I believe that I've had a great foundation. I've had people come into my life who have helped me become great leader, you know, or try to achieve to be a great leader. And so that, I think that's my responsibility to be able to provide that to students um, that come across my path. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think that it's certainly 
one of the many roles of an <laughs> educator in public school. <laughs> Absolutely, there are, there are definitely a lot more roles that we take on than just, and no one teaches you that in principal school or assistant <laughs> principal school or teacher school, you know, about how we, the, it's the, the relationship side, the, 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 the humanistic side of working with children and guiding them. And, and understanding who we are and our biases that we bring to it and how do we combat that. No one ever sits down and talks about those. That we all come from different um, walks of life. Mm -hmm. And even two Cubans have two different walks of life and two different values and two different approaches and stuff. You know, So I just, I just think that that's human nature that we have to be willing to be better listeners and um, to build those relationships. Not You don't have to agree, but you have to have an understanding of where people mm -hmm. come from. What do they say? God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason? <laughs> yes. And sometimes we don't pause enough. Exactly. Um, so you grew up in Alabama. Yes. And then you moved to Atlanta. Yes. And then you moved to Gwinnett County. And you said that you worked for a neighboring school district. You don't have to say which district that was. <laughs> but what are some of the differences between Gwinnett School District and that district? Because we all know Gwinnett is great. Oh, yes. And we know that Gwinnett's education might be even greater than great. Yes. So what are some of the differences and why are you proud to teach in Gwinnett County? So I think the biggest difference is the, con the continuation or the consistency of our leadership mm -hmm. in Gwinnett County. The school board, our um, CEO, superintendent, Mr. J. Alvin Wilbanks, that has grounded, I think, Gwinnett to have the ability to be innovative and approach some of the challenges um, in a really, um, I'm trying to think of the word, an, not an aggressive way, but not to be shy to the changes that, are, that have occurred in our community. To view the changes as something positive versus something negative. Our expectations for student growth and student learning has never changed, whether we have changed in our demographics or the level of poverty. We expect children to succeed and we want them to mm -hmm. succeed. So whether that change has happened or not, it shouldn't be a part of the, even the conversation. That's the huge difference between working in a neighboring district. Um, just the disconnect on the why behind decisions or the aggressiveness or the intuitiveness and the um, innovation of thinking outward to say, these are the changes that are happening, this is what the data is showing, and how do we then create solutions and not mm -hmm. just kind of you know flounder in the, in the issues oh it's just changed we can't do anything about it you know it's it's looking at our approaches on instruction like how do we better meet the needs not only of our changing population but the students learn different. I mean, you got to think of our kids nowadays. You know, they come in with iPad. Uh, yeah. They don't need you to give them the information. Exactly. They're going to ask Google or they exactly. <laughs> they're going to going to, you know, ask, you know, Siri, what is the answer to this question? Or now, you know, the Echo, you can tell you ask your home any question and they know <laughs> it. So, you've got to then you got to be on your toes as an educator to adapt to what our kids need to be able to do, which is, okay, now you're getting all this information. How do you take that information? Is it valid? How does it apply? Like, what are the um, preconceived notions? What's the author's purpose behind why they're sharing it? Is it biased in any way? So that's our job is to kind of navigate all these new approaches. But Gwinnett just stood out. And I, and, and I, I kind of laugh because there's a joke, like you have to drink the Kool-Aid sometimes <laughs> when you work in Gwinnett, but it's true. You know, we're a massive district. There is, um, there is a lot of things that we have a common mission and vision in our district. But the also that we have autonomy at our local schools to be able to adjust based on what, how our, what our needs are in our community. And so it's, you walk into every building in Gwinnett, you get a different sense of that. Um, but, the, what it, but it's still, in essence, the same is that we have the same curriculum, the same mm -hmm. expectations, the same standard. And in the neighboring district, I never got that feeling of consistency and that feeling of that there is a really clear picture of what we want our children mm -hmm. to be able to accomplish or students when they graduate from our high school. And it's, we're not in isolation. You know, I get to work in the best cluster, I say, Brookwood cluster, but I live in the Peachtree Ridge cluster. But the alignment in my cluster where I work, it's not just what 
I do at my school. It's what my sister schools, we work together. Um, and we look at what, the process that our kids, when they begin in kindergarten, and they go all the way to 12th grade. And I don't see that continuation when uh, some of our neighboring. Now, growing up in Auburn was a whole different, I, Auburn City School System was great. I mean, yeah, we were probably one of the few first Hispanics in the community. And there was a lot of growing pains with that. <laughs> Everybody loved to come to our house because they always just thought we were loud, you know, and it's just, that's the way we talk. We talk with our hands, we talk over each other. We were it was fun. Like, we were fun. <laughs> <laughs> and, and everybody loved to come to our house. And, um, but I thought that we kept our identity of who we were and who we are, and we still do. Um, but yet we assimilated in some areas. There were some things that we valued that we knew that would help us um, achieve in this country. And, and it's given my family so many opportunities. And for that, I am beyond grateful. You know, I saw my father and all their struggles. It was, you, and so, but he never let us veer from education. Um, he was an educator. He was the um, head of the Auburn University's foreign language department. He started the abroad programs oh. at Auburn University. Cool. And um, so I saw him value education as a professor. And it just was instilled in, into who I was. And I just, I was lucky to have great teachers. And I also didn't have good teachers. But I think you have sometimes learned from non-examples about who you don't want to be. Um, more than anything so but yeah so now it's it is it's a part of our family there's we have my uncle's an educator he was a special ed teacher so was my aunt Aww. so there's a lot of educators um, in our family it's a proud noble profession for us to have to we've, we're given a gift to to be able to make a difference you know when I watch the kids graduate from Brookwood High School um, so my first class when I was a, when they were fifth graders at Craig graduated two years ago um, and it is just a very humbling experience to see them walk across and receive their diploma and say, I had a small part in who they became, you know, and who they're going to be, become as they, you know, venture off into the world. So it's a very humbling experience to be if you actually just sit and just kind of say, wow, what an awesome opportunity that we have, that we have been given, and, and um, that just to be a part of that. Did you have your box of Kleenex oh. right next to you? I can. I'm <laughs> oh my, no, oh my. but um, <laughs> Bo Ford, who's a principal at Brookwood High School, he mm -hmm. is great. He doesn't want to give it to me till the day of, <laughs> but uh, graduation because it's the the last day of school. He sends me the commencement program, okay. and I take um, all the kids' names and I highlight them who were students at Craig. And so, like this year, like some of these students, I knew them for three years. And so what a, it's just, I'm so excited. I got an email from a parent um, on Monday or earlier this week. And she said, you know, Caroline is graduating and I'm bringing you a graduate, you know, graduation invitation. And to know that I made that small of an impact on somebody's, you know, family and, and who Caroline is and where she's going in her future. I mean, I am just excited to see her walk across and, and all the other Craig students. Um, because we have them for six years, we have them the most. Um, and so, and sometimes I have families I've had since I've started 10 years ago that they're That's still it. at Craig. <laughs> um, and we have a great, we try to have a great relationship because it really is a partnership between the school and the home. I mean, we can't do it on our own. We, it's only six hours, you know, right. that we really are getting them and being able to work with them on their academics. So Angie is a little girl. <laughs> Did you want to be a teacher? Was that your no. goal? No, <laughs> no, no. Why? You talk so passionately about it. <laughs> I actually thought I wanted to be an attorney. Okay. Uh, um, which I feel like I kind of get to do a little bit. I read uh, sometimes all different types of legal documents in my role, but I actually was um, studying international business mm -hmm. and I was gonna try to go to law school. That was my goal and I worked for an attorney in college and he wanted me to work more hours and it just wasn't conducive. I was my sophomore year at Auburn mm -hmm. with going to school and trying to work full time. So I said, I need to kind of look for another job. And I had nannied all through high school and um, I knew I kind of liked working with kids. So I mm -hmm. thought, oh, I'll go work at the preschool uh, right by the campus. And I began working after an after school uh, 
teacher, like with homework help. And, right. and then they asked me to start teaching lessons and I knew that I was doing the wrong thing. I said, I knew that I needed to be a teacher. So I didn't tell my father. <laughs> <laughs> I first went to the college, you know, advisor, you know, your but counselor. He college, yes, right? Yes, okay. but he didn't work in the department that oh, I good. was studying. So I said, I think I want to be a special ed teacher. That was my first because I knew Ms. Howard had had such an important impact on my life. And she said, you will have to start over. And I was like, ooh, I'm two years in. I don't know how well that, <laughs> that would go <laughs> with my father. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I said, "Let me. She, can we look at other options? And she said, well, what grades do you want to work with? And I said, well, I'm an elementary education person. Like I want to work mostly with upper grades, so third, fourth, and fifth. Mm -hmm. So she recommended that I went elementary education and that I eventually go back for my master's in special education. And with that, I could take some of my Spanish courses, my business courses, and use it towards my electives. And so I would be able to, if I worked summer and I went maxed out, I could still graduate by 99, not you know spring 99, but I could graduate <laughs> summer of 99. And so I, I went and talked to my father and he said that, you know, he was amazing that day. I remember going into his office and I said, I don't want you to be, you know, because he always used to tell my daughter's going to be an attorney or a lawyer and eventually he wants you to be a judge. And he was so proud of that. And I didn't want to take it away. And so when I went in to talk, he made me feel so at ease and at peace with my decision. And he was proud that I followed what I really and truly wanted to have passion oh, yeah, and to do sweet. versus like getting into some job later in life and going, I only wish. Mm -hmm. And and allowing myself the freedom to be able to to be okay with not, I'm a, once I make a decision, I like to usually follow through, but kind of breaking that course and allowing, you know, having peace about that decision, allowing myself to explore something new. And it was the best decision. And then at the, the Auburn University job fair, I was recruited by a metro district, really heavy, and I was like, I think I want to go work in Atlanta. And so, you know, like I shared earlier, it's just kind of one thing led to the next. But growing up in Auburn and being a part of that Auburn University City Schools, I, 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 it was invaluable. It was a small town back then. I mean, there was I had like 180 kids in my graduating class, and now in Gwinnett we have like a thousand yeah. in a graduating class. But I, I don't feel like even though like I grew up in a small community, I feel where I work and where I live mm -hmm. is a small community. We're a big place, but the relationships that we have in our schools and in the areas that we live in make it feel that you really do enter a small town. You can still go do Friday night football if you're into that thing. But also I can go eat, you know, at different restaurants, Papitos or wherever I want to go, Papi, sorry. Like I could go do any of that. So I feel like I get the both, the small town growing up in, you know, in Auburn, but yet I feel like I have a little bit of culture in where <laughs> I, in Gwinnett. Like I, if you can go to any of the downtown areas and experience any type of flavor food that your heart desires, but yet, if you want to feel like you're a part of a small community, just go to Brookwood High School on a Friday night and feel like I'm a part of this little world too. It's, you, it, you can't. That's just that's an like the both uh, the perfect situation to have be able to live in both worlds. Best of both worlds. Best of both worlds. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> so if your dad was sitting here right now, and I asked him, "Tell me why you're proud of Angie." What do you think he would say? Because obviously you've got a close relationship yeah. with him and he's been, you know, a, a very influencing figure in your life. He's an academic. Yeah. You have emerged as an academic, but really at the, at the top of your profession as a principal. Yeah. What would he say? Um, he is very proud and he is one of the first people who congratulate me on anything. But it's so hard for me because I always feel like I want to do more for him. I, sometimes I view myself still as a little girl because he really is my hero. I mean, to come from Cuba um, at the age of 15 to be put on an airplane by his mother and father and not know whether Ooh. you're going to see him, see them again. And uh, back then there was an organization called Pedro Pan and you could buy a ticket, a one-way ticket. Um, with some of the airlines and they took children. So once they delivered at that point, they were delivering goods, you're, you know, you're talking early 60s. 
And then um, on the way back, they would bring back children. Was it just him? Him and, and my siblings? uncle. Okay, good. I have an uncle. He's five like, years wow. younger than my father. Okay. But when they landed in Miami, the Catholic orphanage um, picked them up and they took him to a camp. So then he separated from his brother oh my because goodness. they were different age, different language abilities. Right. And so my father was then sent to East Lansing, Michigan. Do you imagine going from Cuba no. to Michigan? <laughs> I'm thinking hot, cold, cold and, uh, so, vibrant, maybe not so vibrant. <laughs> I mean. So he landed um, in an orphanage mm. in East Lansing, Michigan, and my grandfather was a member of a Rotary Club. Ah. And so in Cuba, and so he wrote the president of the Rotary Club, Bob Ling, in East Lansing, Michigan, and he said, will you go look after my child? Aww. And so Bob Ling is kind of, we call him our, the stepfather to my father because he did that. He gave him a job. He had a meat packing um, fa uh, factory, and so mm -hmm. my father worked there, and then they became very close. He ended up paying for my father's master's degree and his doctorate program Wow! Um, as, as a gift to, to my, and my father has <laughs> always tried to give the gift back. Um, he just, he did it out of the kindness and his family is a big part of our family, you know, and, and we, somebody believed in my, from my father, but my father, you know, like I originally said, came from Cuba. He had the clothes on his back and a box of cigars and <laughs> my grandfather gave him the box of cigars because everybody loves a Cuban cigar. Yep. So he figured you can make some money and it will help you. My mom's story is very different. She was an affluent family um, that they had a lot of land. From Cuba as from well? From Cuba as okay. well. Different part of Cuba. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were asked to leave. So, because you either were for Castro or against Castro. Right. And they were obviously weren't into the direction that the country was it was going in. Mm -hmm. And so, so they were sent. They, you know, came, one of those cargo ships brought stuff over. They came over on the ship leaving and they landed in Michigan. And back then in Miami, they just kind of dispersed Cubans all over the United States. And she just happened to land in East Lansing, Michigan, um, the same city as my dad and oh. my uncle, my <laughs> what mother's a love brother. Story. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but tear up on camera. Yeah. <laughs> so it really is. I mean, oh. if you don't believe in faith, that was faith. But mm -hmm. um, my mother's brother was going to Michigan State, and my father was going to Michigan State. And he brought them home, and they met, and I guess the rest is history, as you would say. Oh. But um, they, uh, my father graduated from Michigan State with his undergrad and his doctorate, and then got into, not his doctorate, excuse me, his specialist, and then got his doctorate okay. at Kentucky, University of Kentucky. And while he was there, he got a like one of those associate professors mm -hmm. positions in Auburn, Alabama. He moved my mother, <laughs> who had been in the States for like three years, <laughs> who knew no English to Alabama. So the wow. irony of that <laughs> and her trying to like navigate Alabama back in the, you know, <laughs> 70s, <laughs> early 70s. Was Poor lady. <laughs> he must have really, really loved different. Your dad. <laughs> so for him, I know that he would say that he's beyond proud because he says it all the time. Anytime that there's an opportunity for for me to share any of my accomplishments, he posts it on Facebook. You know, that's his I laugh because I think that's he thinks that's his job to post <laughs> on Facebook. But he is so proud, not mm -hmm. only of me, but he's proud of my siblings. He's super proud of his grandchildren. Oh. I have a niece who is studying at Oxford University. Um, getting her PhD, and so he flew, you know, to Oxford to see her graduate. You know, what a amazing, he just, amazing experience for him to be able to see that you're not sure when you come from another country, right. like, if you're going to be successful or not, and for to see that he's got successful children and, and his grandchildren are succeeding in life. I mean, he feels very accomplished, and his family is his ad admiration. Like he is, he beams pride for us, and he carries our pain and his pain, you mm -hmm. know, in that. But I, I know that he's extremely proud of me, and and that is to me the smallest thing that I can do for all the sacrifices that he made. And I, and we had hardship growing up in Alabama. I mean, there were a lot of people who really thought we were fun and wanted to be at our home, but there were a lot of people who saw us as different and mm -hmm. didn't want us around, I mean, and and would say really mean things. But I mm. think that 
even bad experiences help define what you believe in and who you want to become and who you try to emulate. I mean, we're, I'm definitely not perfect in any which way, but I try to carry some of my scars. You know, I feel like I look very American and I talk very Southern, <laughs> but then I can switch to Spanish and I sound very Cuban. So, <laughs> but um, sometimes people make assumptions, you know, all the time about who we are and what our walks of life are. And um, that's a little bit of, I think that we don't stop and just get to know people and, and have an understanding. I might mm -hmm. not agree with you with, with a lot. Uh, sometimes we can at least be able to to listen to them and to have an understanding why well, get where you're coming from like I, I see where your perspective is mm -hmm. and so I think that that's kind of grounded me and in, in my work you know and that kind of reminds me of you know my ultimate goal was to be a judge you know which is a mediator who mm -hmm. tries to see all sides of everything and tries to have an understanding and try to make a best decision and I think as a principal that is what I do each and every right. day. You know, a parent comes and shares their, you know, side. And then we have the school side, you know, of everything. And how can we come to an agreement? How can we put aside some of the differences and, and try to make a decision on what's best for the child? Because mm -hmm. ultimately, that's that's our goal is sometimes we let adult issues get in the way of, of like, the children, you know, mm -hmm. of what we're trying to accomplish with them. So... But yes, my dad, that. he grounded me in enabling me to, to be able to do what I do each and every day. That is a very impactful story. And I did that without crying. So I feel <laughs> really proud of that because usually anybody, when I have that opportunity to, to share what an amazing person he is. And I don't want to just say my dad, but my mother too. I mean, as a, you know, as a young girl, you know, coming from Cuba, I mean, she got to be with her family, mm -hmm. but her whole life changed in one moment. And um, she she gave me, so my dad gave me the academic side of who I am, uh -huh. but my mom gave me more of who I am as a mother. Um, she threw the most elaborate parties. You know, we like to throw a party in our culture. <laughs> and and we <laughs> And everybody should come and the food and it lasts forever. And that is something that I try to do for my children. Any event, I want to celebrate it because my mom made every event so special. Aww. And she was the arts and crafts person. Like she could, you know, make smock dressings and she could paint something, or but yet she could make a piñata. She could bake the most beautiful. She made a, a castle one time for my sister and I to have a birthday at the same time. With a castle a piñata? Castle. No, it was a, a cake. Castle cake? A oh cake my goodness. with a drawbridge, you know, oh, and everything. Wow. And like I could barely make a, like a two-tier <laughs> cake. But I try to emulate who she mm -hmm. is, that humanistic side. I get that from my mother. And I get the other side of I, I can be a little tough like my dad, mm -hmm. you know. So I feel like I have such pieces of them that are the that you know help me be the person that I want to be like so I don't want to give him all the credit but because she does she is she is somebody who I adore and love and you know when I had my my children here she flew up and stayed a month with me <laughs> and then I was like trying to wrap my legs around her going, don't leave me how can I be a principal and a mommy <laughs> but um she She's, she's beyond proud of me, too, because she got to see that I can still be a mother, but yet still be a career, mm -hmm. you know, driven person and, and, and get to love, be able to do both worlds at the same time. Well, your story is so amazing and special, and you're so fortunate to have two parents yeah. that come from different perspectives. But obviously, you know, you have found that common space, and that became you yeah. and who you are today. Yeah. So do you talk to your own children about their story and your story and how you landed here and how lucky your kids are to have you and be in Gwinnett yes. County? Absolutely. And they know it. My father indoctrinates them. <laughs> <laughs> they go to Camp Abuelo and Abuela every uh -huh. summer and they spend a month with them. <laughs> oh. And uh, they get to go eat Cuban hamburger. My dad already is on the list of everything that they're going to do. What's Cuban hamburger? Well, it's basically a hamburger, but like the onion straws are kind of on top of it. There's okay. just a few more ingredients to okay. it. But, you they know, spice it up? The, <laughs> yes. But he thinks everything's better in, you know, in Cuban food than uh -huh. everything. But, I do uh, too, actually. I love Cuban food. So, <laughs> And like we grew up like not eat like I think I've been more exposed like I never had like broccoli or lima beans <laughs> or like different things. We grew up on way different foods. So I sometimes have to ask people, 
you know, like, what is that? And what does that taste like? And so, you know, so now grits, I... So you didn't know what grits were? Oh, probably. I never had grits. <laughs> and it was a, that's an acquired taste. It is. And I don't drink sweet tea, mm -hmm. you know, so I do love that the ethnic aisle at Publix is growing because I can get my eat on bed, I mm -hmm. can get my Cuban crackers, my guavo. And so they, they love to eat some of those things too. And the, and the girls have mm -hmm. that experience. But um, the family, the value of family to me transcends beyond just a Cuban or a Hispanic, you know, experience. To me, um, family values are what I see that my husband tries to emulate with our children and his family as well, that it's just important. Um, and that's usually a common ground with everybody. Everybody adores and, and wants to be and, and to celebrate their family. And so to us, raising our daughters, is if for them to value and to feel love beyond the new, you know, beyond mom and dad. I mean, we FaceTime my parents all the time. We'll FaceTime my husband's parents, you know, and for them to realize that they're loved, mm -hmm. but to be proud. And so, and they'll say, you know, I'm Cuban American too, Aww. you know. Um, we don't, but they, you know, one has red hair and one has brown hair. So they speak Spanish? <laughs> they uh, can understand a lot more than they speak. Okay. Um, okay. So that's okay. just, yeah. That's something, right? It is, when life goes by, it's a lot easier to say, hurry up, get dressed, we're going to be late <laughs> for school <laughs> in English than it is in Spanish when your husband's there trying to help you. Well. Right. He he is American, mm -hmm. so we're a blended marriage, you know, in essence. And we come from very different walks of life, and that has been something that we've worked through. And you, you'd asked a question earlier about, you know, do I mentor kids? That was probably one of the most prominent questions that I got from, you know, eighth graders at Radloff is, oh, okay. what is it like to be married to an American? Mm -hmm. You know, and I said, um, it's different. Because what, how we were raised and what we value and how we do things is very different from how he was raised and mm -hmm. how they did things and what they valued. And so, but we have, but some of our core beliefs are the same. The family, our faith was mm -hmm. really important to both of us. And we both, you know, are from our Catholics. And so those are the things that kind of grounded us and helped us, you know, when we when we have differences, you know. I wanted to pierce my girl's ear hearings, ears as soon as they walked out of the hospital. And he was like, <laughs> what? You don't do that till you're like eight or nine or something or when you're a teenager. And I was like, oh, no, no. You know, How we, old were they when you did it? Um, I, well, the first one I was allowed to do it at three months, but she had okay. skin sensitivity. So then he made me wait six months on oh. the second one. But he was great. He gave in. And, you know, we put Violeta Rosa, which is like this cologne all over. And, you know, we wanted jewelry. You know, they have their bracelets. They have their necklaces. And he's oh. like, you know, so there are little symbolic things mm -hmm. that we do that he we've had to kind of work through because they just, it's not something that he's accustomed to. And so... But ultimately, if you go back, you know, we, it's that conversation. So the girls are it's like, as long as you find somebody who you have the same values and beliefs with, Absolutely. you can work through anything mm -hmm. as long as you're respectful to each other and try to. And, that's, and it's hard because, you know, sometimes you have something in your mind and you think it's the right way. Marriage isn't easy. <laughs> and no one not. ever said it was. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's a little bit of, you know. But our, our kids, they kind of get the the um, best of both worlds, you know, from his upbringing, you know, to our, my upbringing and they get to have both. And I think that's, that's what's, I think that's kind of what the future mm -hmm. of it is. You know, you, you kind of, we keep blending and making new generations and new experiences yes. for our kids. And so they'll start their, we started our traditions yes. and they'll take them to their kids and they're going to pick and choose which ones they <laughs> like the most. Hopefully the ones that you really <laughs> embrace, they'll <laughs> pick those, right? Right, <laughs> yes, there has to be some of that, so. So you broke from tradition and left your home, your mm -hmm. parents' home before you were married. Were you the, also the first one to marry American guy? Uh, no, okay, so my sister okay. did that. So, so yes. she, got, she did that one first. She okay, did that one good. first. My sister did break <laughs> that mold. My okay. brother, no, he married, uh, she's been half Venezuelan and half Cuban. So, okay. um, and then, of course, I was the youngest. So, mm -hmm. but I, I did my, they were, I was the one who left Auburn. <laughs> 
Okay. So that was my... Are they still there? All still at so Auburn? So my sister still lives at, okay. in Auburn, mm -hmm. and um, my brother lives in Kennesaw area, and then my parents, as soon as uh, he could retire, fully retire mm -hmm. from Auburn, they live in Miami Beach. Oh, wow. So. That's not so bad. <laughs> no. And I appreciate that. That's a great place to go see the family. <laughs> That's a nice family, family vacation. vacation. <laughs> <laughs> and it comes with daycare. Oh. <laughs> Free daycare, so they Even can do better. better. <laughs> Can't complain about that. So, that yeah. is so cool. Well, you have an amazing, diverse, unique story. And just to listen to how much you love your profession and you love your family, you love what you're seeing, your children's possibilities are going to be as they begin to, you know, as they're actually, they're on their life's journey, yeah. but eventually a little bit more independently. <laughs> With mom still there, of course. Yes. You'll, you'll be their angel, right? Yes. <laughs> so you need to give them angels no, to I put should. on their desk, too, yes. like you have yours. So if you had to describe Gwinnett in one word or a phrase, what would that be? I think community. I think it's, that's what grounds me and why I love being here in Gwinnett. Like mm -hmm. the pride that I have in the community that um, I work in, but also and that I live in. Mm -hmm. um, it's really something special. And I, for, th for that, I don't take it for granted. You know, we've been here, you know, since we've moved to Gwinnett in 2005. Uh -huh. So 13 years, you know, and we've been able to really immerse ourselves and there's such a blend between work and personal for me. I, I, I don't think I know where one ends and one begins. I go to a birthday party, I, I'm still on because they're parents, you know, right, or right. vice versa, or I go to a game or anything. I still. Isn't that the ultimate? But that's what personal makes professional blends. Blend. And that's what makes it a community. Like, I just feel that. Th that I get to live in a really utopia world in that essence that I don't have that separation mm -hmm. and that the work that I'm doing, I know that it's being, you know, it's my, my kids are experiencing it, but I also can give to others. And so that's just something really powerful. So feel really blessed. I mean, that's probably, you know, what I feel about being here in Gwinnett. And, and for the people who saw great leadership mm -hmm. potential in me and, and for the leaders who continue to cultivate who I am and inspire me, I'm, I'm forever grateful that because it's really, it's, it's beginning in Gwinnett. So what's your next step? Oh, Assistant superintendent? <laughs> I'm really, I, that's, I get asked that a lot. And I think the next step will rise when it's that time. Mm -hmm. I really do believe that a door opens when it's the right time. So I want to follow this path. Um, I still, you know, I have a first grader, and so, I, you know, I want to be able to be able to balance being a mother and being a principal at the same mm -hmm. time, but I don't see myself leaving a school environment for a while. I know that eventually I want to be a part of the district offices mm -hmm. and in some form or capacity, but I see that later on in my career. I've got um, probably uh, maybe 11, 12 more years as you know in this profession, mm -hmm. and um, I want I got in it to to really be with children, and I get to begin and end my day with children at Craig. I have mm. the best job. I stand and wait for them to get off the bus, and I get hugs, and oh, I get we can all use more hugs hug. every day, right? So <laughs> that I, I'm just not ready to leave that. Mm -hmm. I get to see my work come to fruition. I say my work. And it's really the work of my teachers because I'm in awe of what they do each and every day. A teacher gives her heart and soul, um, and they are demanded and to resources. Do yes, more than you would ever imagine. Mm -hmm. In my ten years as a principal, the times that I've had to go in front of them and say, "I know that you're already doing this, but I need you to do this more, and let's take this journey together." Um, they leave me, I tell them every day, it's a privilege and an honor to walk alongside such amazing leader, uh, like, like leaders in their classroom, but educators, because without them, I don't think our school would be half the school that it is, because they help make that vision and reality of what we try to strive in Gwinnett to have a system of world-class schools, and to me, Craig is on its journey to becoming one of those schools. Mm -hmm. If we're not already there, I already think we're there. But, you know. <laughs> so, well, yes. I do know Gwinnett is not going to let you go. <laughs> you are going to stay planted right here in Gwinnett County. It's a great place. It is. So as we wrap up, you know, I have to ask this question. Oh, okay. We have Buford Highway and all these amazing Spanish restaurants yes. along Buford Highway. 
Where can I get good Cuban food in Gwinnett? Uh, in Gwinnett, my yes. favorite rest, Cuban restaurant is Mojitos, and it's actually in downtown Norcross. I have been there. That is they my have music on Friday favorite, and Saturdays. Favorite, favorite yes. one. Um, okay. So my favorite is vaca frita, okay. um, which is like a shredded pork that's mm -hmm. been fried, and then black beans and rice. I get like the whole thing. And then their guava cheesecake is to die for. I mean, I'm a big flan person, but guava, guava cheesecake, cheesecake is is amazing. Oh, so if I could ever give okay. anybody a recommendation, <laughs> it's mojitos. That's been my favorite by far. Um, and they also have mojitos. <laughs> they do. They do. I'm down for that. That sounds like a great Friday night for me. <laughs> and the music is a lot of fun. So mm -hmm. you kind of feel, you know, and it's so small and quaint. It, it, it's a nice restaurant to, to visit. I haven't been there and. Gosh, I guess a couple of years, but I'm serious. It might be this Friday yeah, night. Yeah, you need that to go. good. <laughs> well, thank you so much for thank being you. here. I want to give you a oh. hug because we talked about hugs. Oh, <laughs> Angie, this was awesome. Thank I enjoyed you. learning about you, your story, your family, <laughs> your goals, a little insight into your next step. <laughs> so thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. Thank you.